Good afternoon and welcome to PCR Bifurcation Webinars 2020. Today we will discuss how should I select and treat patients with bifurcation lesion needing a two-stand strategy. My name is Goran Stanković and I have really pleasure and privilege to moderate seminar with two great guys, great cardiologists and friends, Dr. Adrian Benning from UK and Dr. Gabor Todd from Austria. We will discuss plan to stand strategy, and we actually would like to understand and discuss clinical and anatomical scenarios favoring side brain stenting. We'll try to understand decision-making process for selection of optimal side brain stenting technique, and finally, to discuss how to prevent and manage complications. And just to open this discussion, I'll present European Bifurcation Club algorithm for elective two-stand strategy selection. So we believe that we may need two-stand strategy upfront in bifurcated lesions with extensive atherosclerotic involvement of both main branch and clinically relevant side branch. And then based on the estimated risk of losing the side branch, if the risk is low after stenting of the main vessel, we do provisional on the left-hand side, and then we do pot, kissing, and we finish procedure with T, tap, or culotte stenting. In the other occasion that we estimate the major risk of losing or compromising the side branch after main branch stenting, then we either start if we are experienced with DK uh, crush technique, or we do inverted provisional stenting from the main vessel into the side branch, and then we do inverted culotte, inverted T, or tap. So I will ask Dr. Todd to present his case. Gabor, uh, please share with us your case. Thank you very much, Goran. Uh, I would like to discuss here with you uh, a case of a 68-year-old um, patient uh, who came with uh, a somewhat reduced ejection fraction and otherwise I would say a typical uh, clinical history in addition to intracranial hemorrhage and viruses in their both legs to our cat lab for cornea catheterization. Um, uh, here on the next slide, you can see uh, the angio of this patient demonstrating actually a CT of the right cornea artery and extensive disease uh, from the left main towards the LED and towards the circumflex. Although the syntax score is high, the patient refused surgery and the surgeons also turned down uh, for surgery for com due to comorbidities. So surgery is out of discussion. We had to go on uh, with PCI um, in this very case. Yeah, thanks Gabor for sharing this case. It's really complex anatomy, left main multivessel disease with occluded right. So Adrian, if this is the case in your hospital, what would be your plan? How would you start? And uh, is this uh, really a case that uh, requires expertise by the highly trained operator in bifurcation PCI, or you think you should refer to center with such expertise? Uh, thanks, Goran, and it's great to be uh, sharing these cases uh, with you. Um, well, it's a tough case, isn't it? And I think quite a lot of it, interestingly, is from, my, from my perspective, is around the anatomy of the right coronary. You know, if the right coronary was stenosed uh, but not occluded, then I would usually just do the right coronary first to reduce the ischemic burden whilst I was treating the left main. In this case, it appears that the uh, right coronary is chronically occluded. Why do I say that? Well, it looks at, like it's well collateralized. It looks like it's chronically occluded over quite a long segment based on the pattern of um, collateral filling. And consequently, it's, although the stump looks somewhat tapered, it may be difficult to treat um, anti-gradely in the first session. So if that were the case, um, and I think it's going to be a complex CTO, then obviously having availability of the left coronary for retrograde and for filling um, probably makes it more sensible perhaps to do the, the, the left main bifurcation first. But certainly if I was going to do the right coronary first, you need to have someone that could do anti-grade dissection re-entry, I think. Yeah, Thanks. I, the, com yeah, I completely agree with you, yes. Yeah, 
but I agree with you. Uh, and my question on dedicated expert was actually CTO expert that you need to have in your team, because this is the case to decide just whether you really start by opening well collateralized right, which will of course increase the safety of left main PCI afterwards, or you start by uh, left main PCI. Gabor, what was your decision? Uh, what was your thinking? Yeah, so actually uh, our consideration was following that uh, while the uh, CTO of the right has the chance that you need a retrograde approach, um, uh, which would be, uh, I think, too risky through this very diseased left main and LED. On the other hand, we expected that treating the left main um, uh, is, I mean, it's a complex procedure, but we uh, we are not expecting uh, occlusion or or, or or much problem from the PCI itself. We believe that we can ensure in this multimorbid patient uh, 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 rush improvement by treating uh, uh, the left main first and approaching the CTO afterwards. And when we talk about the left main, uh, our strategy was following the algorithm that you just presented, that the, the risk of occlusion of any of the uh, daughter branches, LED or circumflex, is relatively low in, due to the, the big angulations towards the, towards the circumflex and actually not significant but not critical um, disease in the ostium and the proximal segment. And therefore, our approach was uh, main brand stenting, but keeping in mind that the circumflex will also practically definitely need the second stand uh, uh, during the procedure. Um, yeah. So in this so way, we I get can, to the idea of yeah. doing culotte technique. Yeah, if I can interrupt you. Yeah, if I can interrupt you. I, I completely agree with the estimation that uh, because of almost 90 degree angle and not so severe lesion at the, the ostium of the circ, my strategy would be more or less similar, stenting left main towards the LED, and then optimizing the result, and then uh, performing kissing in such large circumflex, and then evaluate. I think when we say provisional, provisional does not mean single stent strategy. It's provisional uh, with layers of complexity that you are adding when you think it's necessary. So stenting towards the LED, pot, Kiss and then we evaluate the ostium of the circ. It's tight, and I think it deserves to plan upfront two stand strategy. I think in my case it will be either T or TAP, whether I'm able or not to cross through the very distal stand strat and then uh, scaffold the ostium. So show us the sequence of uh, steps that you perform, and I'm curious what our audience is thinking and whether they have other ideas. Adrian, what you wanted I was to say? Just to say, you know, I think this case looks gives a good illustration about trying to decide what you think is the reference vessel diameter. You know, I don't know what the reference vessel diameter is in that circumflex, which is the normal uh, segment. And it, to me, the more you look at the mid circumflex, the more diseased the proximal circumflex looks, and it almost looks consequently like a definition two type lesion, doesn't it? You know. It probably has got uh, a segment of circumflex disease which is sufficient to fulfill the criteria. And under those circumstances, an upfront two stent strategy probably is the best way forward. And under those uh, circumstances, again, you're looking at what you think is your best two stent strategy uh, and how you uh, make that strategy safe and reproducible. And for most of us, that would involve imaging um, and lesion preparation. Uh, our, colleague point, actually, Bogdan, Bogdan Janus, our colleague Bogdan Janusz agrees with you that uh, uh, provisional as a strategy is a good way to go, but imaging first. Uh, Gabor, do you think imaging before uh, planning the steps makes sense in this case? Yeah, exactly. I would like to take here then uh, the comment of all the three of yours, including our colleague who answered in the chat. So, uh, first of all, provisional strategy has the attractivity that you have many decision points later on when you can still decide for one technique or the other. You are not forced into the uh, to a, a, a one-way road. On the other hand, uh, a diameter that Adrian, our colleague, mentioned, and here comes imaging. So understanding the diameter is really 
critical, the reference diameters, whichever te yeah. technique you use. Uh, and I will show you immediately why, why we meant this. Um, yeah. So checking feasibility, checking technical feasibility for, for, one stand to, for one strategy or the other. Finelo, we all, all know very well, but what is the critical point of Finelo, especially in the case of left main, that uh, uh, the larger a side branch, the larger the discrepancy between the distal, distal daughter branches and the proximal main branch. And understanding which technique you choose, you have to know that your stent has to accommodate to the distal diameters as well as the proximal diameters. So here I also agree absolutely with Adrian what mentioned that if we stand the circumflex and we want to come to the left main, we have to really define a good distal reference healthy vessel and then we can put a relatively large stand which will nicely accommodate to the left main in case we decide to to a culotte technique. And there uh, it's critical to use imaging to understand this. So what we did here, okay. check the feasibility and understood what kind of devices we have on our shelves, which uh, uh, nominal diameter stand can accommodate to, to that given uh, left main. And once you checked it feasible, we went on with the following steps in this case. So after um, uh, lesion preparation, we put our stand first towards um, the LAD in case. In this case, um, uh, afterwards. Uh, Gabor, after can I? Yes. Yeah, while you are going through the slides, can I ask you? There is a question from Rosa Lazaro. Why culotte? The angle is good for T. What made you planning culotte instead of T? Very good point. Uh, I would say, as you will see, this decision comes later. <laughs> so okay. uh, first here, as, as Gora mentioned in the beginning, we follow the steps of provisional. So we stand now provisional approach towards the LED and we can decide later on uh, what we want to do with the circumflex. Doing like this, we can still end with T and protrusion. We can end with T and we can end with, uh, with uh, culotte. So I would Take this question, and, and if you agree, I will answer uh, a few sure. minutes later. Sure, please. Perhaps I could just make a comment about tea. You know, I I can't really remember the last time I did a tea. I I just think it's, it rarely is the tea that you think it is, you know, and I think trying to really be really accurate. Um, and the problem you then have, if you miss, it's quite a difficult conversion. Um, you know, what are you going to do if you – if you miss proximal and you've got too much stent, okay, then you can you, you turn it into a tap, but that's okay. But if you're a bit distal, you then end up with a very difficult position because you've then got to put another stent in and you end up with an awful lot of metal and you can end up in quite a mess. So I, I, I don't favor T very often, particularly for circumflex um, uh, osteum. I think it, it, it rarely is the right angle that you want it to be. Okay, Gabor, please go on. So as I say that first we follow the steps of a provisional. So we stented left main to the LED, then we perform pot. And what is uh, critical during the pot and in left main, I think this is the dangerous moment of the whole procedure when you have uh, uh, actually a floating stent in the, in the left main and the guiding there. So it's very important to nicely disengage the guide and, and perform a proper pot uh, before you... Uh, start want to re-engage again. Then comes the wiring. Uh, you go eventually with the loop towards the 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 LED or the stented segment, and on the way back you just jump into possibly the distal cell. Here, this is uh, the proper moment of imaging to understand that we, you are throughout inside the stent and not behind of any struts, and you cross through a proper cell towards the side range. So once it's, once it's confirmed that here we did a uh, kissing dilation. As you see, this kissing dilation here, until now we did provisional technique. But I would strongly recommend to do this kissing dilation in, even in the case when you have in mind that you, you will do culotte, so kind of turn culotte into a DK culotte approach. And why? You will see here in the image on the, uh, on the bottom. So left is the conventional culotte when you just open up towards the unstented vessel and put the stent. And look at what this red arrow shows, how much metal is pulled away from, from the uh, previously stented segment and how it looks if you performed 
kissing dilation before. You see on the right, so a kind of DK culotte approach. First, a nice kissing. You will have a brilliant, nice result in the first stand, which stand doesn't move a micromillimeter by putting the other stand inside. So I leave this question open here for you. What do you think in which case you will have the better chance to wire properly um, again the side branch? Uh, to be honest, I feel more comfortable with the with the green arrow than with the red one. So this yeah. is what we Thank did you. here. Thank you, Gabor. This is really excellent bench testing demonstration. If you can go back uh, on the previous slide, yeah. just to help our colleagues understand better. So when you inflate balloon after stenting of the either side branch or the main vessel, you actually create small deformation of the stain just opposite to the ostium of the other branch. And the best moment to correct it is to do kissing at this point, if I understood com uh, correctly. And I think many colleagues like Dr. Mazar say, what about DK mini culotte, uh, then imaging and then provisional. And I think there is also a question whether we should do, sorry for giving uh, uh, again one step back. Would you consider DK crush in this case? So, uh, uh, answering the questions one by one, uh, yeah. mini culotte, culotte, mini culotte, or as we are, we are published string as uh, the miniest culotte, they are all just the same at the end. Of course, you don't want to have an extreme long double layer. You can minimize it as much as possible. Actually, the, min the double layer doesn't need to be more than one or two uh, struts, yeah. if at all. But you want to be sure that the, uh, the other stand comes through the, uh, through the previous lumen and then uh, uh, leaving to the side cell and you are not crushing. So I think uh, the goal is to minimize the, the length of the double layer as much as in that given case possible. So I fully agree it can be mini or it can be string or now whatever, it, it can be min minimized. DK, DK crush? crush. Yeah, yeah, DK it, crush. It's definitely doable. It's definitely doable for this case as well. Um, I spare DK crush in my practice for cases where where I have I really afraid of losing the access to the side branch, and I want to treat the side branch, and I never want to uh, lose the access to the main branch. So my typical DK crush cases are mainly the uh, the patients who are hemodynamically unstable or very critical hemodynamic conditions and very critical access to the side branch and the main branch as well. Yeah, can I ask also, Adrian, there are many questions on whether we should use stentis in this case. Uh, I, I personally don't agree. It's unpredictable which uh, strut will be disconnected, but what is your opinion? I think um, it all comes down to one's experience. And I think if you're experienced with Stentis and you've had good experience with Stentis and you've imaged the results that you've achieved with Stentis, then maybe that's an option. My experience with Stentis is small. Um, to be honest, I don't do very much DK crush either. I tend yeah. to use the original approach for most things and I'll usually go to DK to a, a clot if I need a second stent. So I, I think... Um, rehearsing and practicing and perfecting the techniques you're comfortable with, we all have to have an open mind for new technology. We all have to have an open mind for um, uh, ev evolution of our techniques. But I do think um, inevitably rehearsing what you do to the point where it's good is, is the right thing. So uh, I would not personally start to use a new dedicated stent if I was only going to use it twice a year. If you're going to use yeah. it, then you're going to use it, and you've got to get good with it. Exactly. exactly. Uh, okay, uh, before going to the next step, uh, how do you select, Gabor, balloon for optimizing left main LED position? And if you remember what kind of stent you used in this case, you showed us that expansion capacity is the key. What stent you selected in this case? So in this case... Uh, uh, Again, I think the critical thing is to understand the stand platforms that you are using, where they change between small design and large design. And, and my belief is that uh, the critical thing to find a stand which can accommodate to the size of the left main, 
I would even say even on the price of oversizing for the LED, risking some dissection, because what you really doesn't want to have that you have a nicely opposed stent in the, uh, in the LED, but you can never reach the diameter of the, uh, of the left main. So actually, uh, we are practically, uh, uh, what stent in this case was used, I, I believe it was a 4-0 for the, uh, for, for the uh, LED. But we have to understand 4.0 and 3.5, it's for most uh, platforms the same. They can reach uh, yeah. already the uh, huge diameter in the left main. Yes, people are asking, uh, Gabor, what is the expansion capacity table available or not? Uh, you can find it in, uh, uh, I think, in the journal in 2016, International Journal of Cardiology by Nicolas Foan Group. You exactly. can see, you can print and use in your lab. I'm pretty uh, sure we introduced uh, some of the guidelines, um, EBC guidelines. I think perhaps 2018 uh, may may have it. Yeah, we updated also in EBC consensus document 2018. Okay, drug eluting balloon uh, for the side branch. I think because of the fuseness of disease and large caliber, I don't think that uh, just doing DEB in this case uh, is a good option for long term outcome. Uh, I uh, I hope this is also the reason, Gabor, why you decided to go with the stent. And please show us the stenting of the circumflex. Yeah. So exactly. So now, if you go to the next slide, this is the uh, this is the result after kissing. Uh, again, as Adrian mentioned at the beginning, it doesn't look that tight. But if you take as reference diameter, so at the level of the marginal, then you see that it's it's a tight lesion. We already. Uh, um, I, I, we decided to, here that we need uh, proper stenting and treatment for this, especially that the patient has a CTO in the right. So these are the patient's two vessels at the moment. So uh, after that, um, again, after lesion preparation, we, pl we placed uh, the second stent in the, uh, in the left main circumflex continued in a, in a, in a, culotte fashion, uh, we, can, we can argue whether, whether the, the double layer could be shorter or not. I think, of course, as I mentioned before, you can, you can uh, make it even shorter in case. Again, the same story as at the beginning. We just repeat the steps of a provisional, but now in direction of circumflex. So disengage the guiding just to avoid uh, longitudinal uh, compression of the stent uh, and then uh, performing uh, uh, proper uh, uh, the second yeah. part of this case Gabor, we are both I, in the left yeah. I, I would like to discuss very briefly now with you and Adrian uh, multiple questions are coming how long we should pull back stents to the ostium of the left main or spare some part whether we should stand from the ostium with the LED stent or with the circumflex uh, Adrian what is your practice um, I don't think it's obligatory to cover the ostium. And I think when uh, you've got a very capacious left main that can be six, seven millimeters, it's foolish to try and cover the ostium because you won't get a stent to um, oppose in a huge left main. I think it depends very much on the extent of the disease. I don't think it matters whether it's the LED stent or the circ stent that covers the disease as long as it's covered. And I think... Uh, it's one of the key issues, one of the key things that we find um, when we image is that the proximal portion of the stent or stents has not been properly opposed within the body of the main and within the ostium of the main. So I think um, not underestimating uh, the actual size of the left main is the mistake that people make because you sometimes don't have a reference diameter to go to if the Left main disease are here, it's relatively short, the left main, and probably quite diffusely diseased. So my strategy would be the same as Gabor, I would have covered it in this case. But if you have a, a big left main where ultimately it's only the bifurcation of the left main which is diseased, then I wouldn't cover that. But what I would make sure of is that the transition from undiseased left main into stent is good and that my stent is properly opposed. If I may yeah. comment on this one, because sure. I have a, my approach to how long we have to go to the left main is relatively simple. We need a certain length in order we can do a proper pot. 
So the length in the left main should be as long as your shorted balloon that you have, because you you are really obliged to do pot. On the other hand, it doesn't make sense to leave three, four millimeters unstented, because what if you cause a dissection, then uh, you will have at, at the end a massive triple layer alone. But also don't enter the conical part of the left main where it's a issue of thinking that you could reach any any good a position. So exactly. I think they're very good comments. So the other thing I would say is if you can avoid, if you can avoid leaving stents hanging out, sometimes you can't avoid it. It's probably better to leave it out. You know, it's not yeah. not to have stent hanging out into the uh, into the aorta because re-engagement can be very difficult and re-engagement with wires is very unpredictable thereafter. So yeah. I, I think probably when we started stenting left mains, there really was a kind of um, a diktat that you had to cover the ostium, but I don't think that's right anymore. Yeah, there is a, one question that I think deserves a really comments by both of you. Uh, our colleague Serob Manukian sent the question, surprisingly some elder colleagues of mine are avoiding doing pot in provisional stenting, preferring over the late distal part of the stent. I don't know why, but it looks bizarre for me. Uh, I think, Gabor, you did the uh, true real provisional algorithm with pot and then kiss and then second pot. Uh, please uh, clarify for our colleague Manukian that it's really uh, the key step of provisional is to perform proximal and not distal over dilation because of the fractal geometry that you nicely presented. Yeah, so I fully agree that actually the, uh, if there is a critical step, step in any kind of bifurcation, uh, PCI is the pot. Uh, we know that kissing, you can decide whether you want to do kissing or not. It's not that obvious that it will improve uh, outcomes. But pot is really the, the step which improves uh, outcome of patient whenever you do the bifurcation. And simply why? Because as I showed at the beginning, you have you have massive diameter mismatch between the stent what you selected according to distal diameter and the left main. So either it will just hang in the middle of the left main with no opposition, or you can argue that there might be a position if the left main was diseased, but then it's underexpanded. So it means that you did not uh, did not dilate the left main properly. So exactly. I think if you can. If there is one step what we should remember for any kind of bifurcation PCI is the pot. Exactly. Anything to add, Adrian? From Excel, which showed that if you uh, treat a, uh, a lesion which did not require two stents with two stents, the outcome is less good. And of course, that's what happens if you put if you size to the proximal vessel, so the, if you've got a 4 -0 left main and a 3 -0 LED and you put a 4 -0 stent in, what you do is you cause carina shift, you generate a stenosis in the branch, which then means you've got to try and put a second stent in. And so I would say to your colleague um, that his colleagues are putting in two stents when they don't need to put two stents in. And unfortunately, the outcomes are less good. So um, pot, which means that you respect the fractal geometry, as you've said, Goran, so that this, yeah. you've got the right stent size in the main branch and the right stent size in the, um, in the proximal vessel is the technique. And it's probably the key technique that we've learned over the last 10 years. So um, right. colleagues need to get into this PCR webinar and learn. Thank you so much. So, uh, Gabor, uh, please show the remaining steps of, of the DK culotte. Yes, and here I will be quick because actually what we do now is the, just the repetition of the previous steps, but now towards the, the circumflex. So as said, we put the stent, we do the pot as the critical steps of uh, provisional. Uh, very important point that on one hand, we always emphasize that pot should go uh, until the carina to have good a position, but the other way around, it's also true that pot has to come virtually really to the uh, to the entrance of the stent. So you really have to do pot along the entire stented proximal main branch uh, segment. In this case, in the left main, and uh, once it's done, again the same step, rewiring. You go to your lately stented vessel, 
you pull back the wire and you jump through the distal uh, cell towards the, uh, the previous, uh, so towards the actual daughter branch. And again, uh, just to be sure that you are not behind struts and you are through the proper uh, cell, you can confirm it very nicely with imaging. And once it's done, you follow with kissing dilation, kissing dilation sized according to the daughter branches. So in this case, it was four zero and three five, and you close your procedure uh, with uh, proximal optimization again from carina backwards to the entrance of your previous stent. So yeah. uh, if we compare baseline and final results, uh, it uh, shows some improvement. And what we should remember from this case, and this is why I believe it's, uh, it's a nice technique because you have many uh, uh, points where you can change your strategy if you want or if the patient needs. And the steps are also relatively easy to remember because you do a the steps of the provisional to one direction and then the steps of the provisional to the either, either direction. Bravo, Gabor. I think it's excellent demonstration. And there are multiple questions on the importance of double kissing approach to culotte. Uh, just to clarify for our colleagues, selecting first to stand towards the LAD or the CERC is the same. It's the, the same culotte. You are doing two times provisional. It's just the selection whether in this case you will go first towards the LAD and you clarified that because of collateral supplies for the occluded right, you selected to stand first towards the LAD. And the uh, questions regarding the length of disease of the side branch of the circumflex to determine whether you need second stent or not. Uh, just to repeat uh, precisely, our colleague asked, uh, if the lesion length in the circ is shorter than 10 millimeters, would you still use two stand strategy or you will go provisional with kissing? You know, uh, well, uh, as you see, we did, we did with kissing. So we did all the steps what the colleague suggests. We finished the procedure with an with a intermediate stop point with a complete provisional approach. And then you have the chance to evaluate in that very patient whether you still need to put a stent in the side branch or not. You can do it either with imaging to see after kissing you had dissection or not. You can, based on your angiographic result, whether you have 50% stenosis left or not. You can would say in this case, as said, we have a CTO of the right. It's a large circumflex. We want to have really a, a perfect result, a full pavement of this large uh, circumflex. And for all these reasons, we decided uh, that, uh, that we put a stand. If, 10 millimeters is a very strict cutoff or not, I would say not. Uh, okay. uh, but we, we started this procedure with an open mind to finish it like this or like that, as the procedure yeah. requires. Yeah. Uh, does, does complex bifurcation stenting like this a mandate that main operator must be available around to meet uh, any eventuality? Uh, do you have, uh, in other words, senior uh, who is supervising? I know that you are senior in your lab, but this is, I think, more general question when you plan to stand strategy, whether we really need two people to exchange and uh, discuss together difficult steps. I agree with, uh, with that. Uh, and I think for complex cases, for left main, especially if it's calcified, I think two seniors is a good option. I don't know the practice in your labs so in our lab we have the we have the practice that we, for especially for cases which are not the uh, not the regular everyday cases but there is some 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 special there's something to learn for all of us i mean uh, we learn for all the cases we try to have two people on the table whether it's a junior and senior or whether two seniors it uh, doesn't matter but uh, simply uh, four eyes and two minds together it's it's always nice for such cases yeah, yeah. Uh, Gabor, uh, you have people in the room who are able to do and react to whatever happens. So you need to have someone who can do rotablation. You need to have someone who can do and interpret imaging. And I think uh, you actually get a much better result having two people there because 
you need a certain amount of intellectual stamina and rigor to keep you you're making sure that you're pushing on towards excellence throughout the whole thing and you're not just starting to tire and um and trying to get to the end i we we're very keen on having two people at the table i think it's uh, an excellent way forward and i would say to you um, it won't happen unless you make it happen. The hospital aren't going to tell you to put two people on the table. It's you as an operator that makes that happen. It doesn't make you a, a weaker person to get a colleague to come and help you. Or a, uh, and, and that's how I would highly recommend it. Yeah. Final question for Gabor. Any comments regarding hemodynamic support, the impeller, balloon pump, left main with CTO of RCA? What is your practice? It's a very, very good point, uh, and uh, I fully agree with this question. Uh, I would say if this case was uh, heavily calcified left main, where we expect long and multiple uh, manipulation in the left main with less predictability how it will go during the procedure, then I would definitely put an impeller. Here, where I assume that the lesion is soft and it was confirmed by imaging at the beginning, where I'm sure, almost sure, that I can put a stent left main LED and then restore the, the supply of most of the myocardium, there we did not put an impeller. Perfect. Show us what happened with the right and then uh, we conclude the case number one. Yeah, so if we can show the next case, there are that was discussed and then the uh, CTO of the right was done in a second procedure actually um, uh, a few days later also with good results surprisingly it went integrate so uh, this might change a bit our initial strategy but yeah yes yes uh, okay thank you very thank you very much Gabor excellent cases really uh, uh, and comments as well Adrian please show us your case because I think you have something very similar and I would like to see what happened in your case. Thank you very much, Goran. Uh, I'd like to show you this case, which is uh, a tricky colot. So let's go on to the next slide, if you would, please. And the next slide. So this is a patient who's 80, uh, male, hypertensive, raised cholesterol. They already have a pacemaker. We know they have airways disease, a previous stroke, documented disease of the carotid arteries. And they're admitted at a local hospital with uh, acute chest pain, raised troponin, and a diagnosis of a non-ST elevation myocardial infarction. Predictably, based on the comorbidities, this patient was turned down for coronary artery bypass surgery and accepted uh, subsequently for PCI. Slide, please. And this is the slide that you can see. You see the pacemaker lead, and you see the relatively focal disease uh, in the left main. Initially, your eyes go to that, but there's also disease in the mid LED there, which is really quite severe. If you look in the bottom right-hand panel, which is the LAO caudal, you'll see that the pattern of the, the disease is, is somewhat unusual, and it appears to really involve the carina of the bifurcation. It's almost as if there's a, uh, a ball of something sitting there in the, in the left main bifurcation. Next slide. I'm very, I'm very worried with this anatomy, and I would like, instead of reading those questions, to hear what Gabor will do with this kind of complexity in his lab. Yeah, uh, <laughs> it's a very good point, but I think what is very important, as you mentioned, with uh, imaging and thinking about rotab later, uh, it's very important in case of left main, especially left main, to understand. Uh, plaque composition in the sense that you can you know what you expect from this lesion what you don't want that you start dilate and dilate and it doesn't open or it ends with a massive dissection so i would say for this reason again understanding first based on imaging but also based on this angiography i would have a very low threshold to to rotor blade is just 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 to ensure that i can really follow the steps of dilation stenting as I plan and I don't face any unexpected uh, disasters. Uh, so I think it's imaging, a case for reservation. Imaging, yes or no, or later on during the case or from the beginning? Later on for sure. If we need it at the beginning, uh, again, I think it, uh, it, it's, it's nice to have at the beginning, but uh, it looks quite uh, calcificated from the beginning on. So I'm 
almost sure that we need to rotablate it. Probably I would rotablate and then do an imaging to understand diameters for the PCI itself. Yeah, both vessels are really severely diseased, very calcific, so I don't think we have doubt to stand strategy up front. But again, provisional, as you uh, presented in your case, tending towards the LAD and then keys, and then standing towards the circ or something else. I think anatomy might change massively after rotablation. So we will have a better understanding so, about the whole. Yeah. There is a calcified globe sitting in the in the crooks in the or the in the in the carina or in the bifurcation. So once you rotablate yeah. it through, I think it will look completely different. So I would make my strategy afterwards. Yeah, you know, we already received a question from Dr. Alvaizi, why not to use intravascular lithotripsy already at this point? And I really thank you all for sending your questions. You really make us thinking and exchanging, and, and I really learn each time. At every webinar, I learn a few things. Uh, Adrian, please uh, tell us what is your decision and start with the case uh, in order to present all the steps. So just to take that question, this lithotripsy wasn't available at the time that this case was done. And uh, but lithotripsy is, a, is an interesting option, although I suspect it might have been difficult to get the lithotripsy balloon in, at least as the initial strategy. And of course, lithotripsy is a great treatment when we have concentric pulsification. We're only going to really know that um, if we image. But uh, so next slide, please. So you've seen on, while, while the slide's been running the things that we were thinking about. But the choices we made were a radial approach with a sheathless guide. We do that commonly uh, when we're using radial, <clears throat> as it gives us access to, to big uh, lumen. And to do uh, in, in immediate rotablation to both LED and circumflex, then to stent uh, the prox LED and then come back and do a left main clot. So that was our strategy that we'd chosen. Next slide, please. So we went on to do um, uh, rotablation initially to the LED and then to circumflex. And as, as the case moves on, we then did balloon dilatation to both vessels and got good expansion at both, um, both lesions. Next slide, please. And then we went on to treat the mid-LAD. We stented right back to the proximal LAD uh, with onyx stents, getting a good result. And as you can see in the next slide, we then uh, stented the ostium of the circumflex, proximal circumflex, and did pot. I would point out that the balloon expansion in the uh, left-hand panel there looks good. Uh, we did pot, we recrossed, we predilated the ostium of the LED, and then stented, uh, joining the left main stent to the previous stents we put into the LED. Both stents were sized to 3.5 to give us the opportunity to go up to nearly 5.5 or 6 should we need to within the left main. Next slide, please. Up to that point, everything had been going really very well. Um, but at this point, uh, we did our final pot, we crossed with a wire, and then I could not get a balloon to go down. So I tried quite hard. And then I put a moved the wire, and I moved the wire again, and I tried quite hard. And then I tried a series of devices. And unfortunately, I could not get a device to cross into the circumflex. So I've completed the, um, the kist, I've done the pot, and I can't get it to cross. And I tried a series of wires, in, uh, wires in positions, a series of catheters, and then sequential increases in pot to a degree that was perhaps oversized. Frustratingly, we didn't have imaging in the lab available on that day. And ultimately, we had to pause at this point, having tried seven different wires, three different balloon sizes to pot, and fail to recross. So if people in the audience on, on the line have questions about or thoughts about what we could do at this point, perhaps, uh, Gabor, um, what, what, what would you do? Yeah, <laughs> it's a very good point, probably. But I would try as, as bailout uh, uh, putting maybe more wires at the same time and trying over one wire via, uh, and uh, over the other one. Sometimes it also works that you put one balloon on the one wire and you put another balloon on the other wire and then uh, one will slip at the end. 
um, you can do imaging to under understand uh, what's going on. Although if you can't get there with any wire, you will also not be able to advance your, your imaging catheter to the circumflex. Um, but uh, this reminds me very well on the left image of our bench demonstration, uh, what I showed during the previous case. Yeah. Well done, yeah. Goran, have you any thoughts? Yeah, I uh, I think one thing that I will definitely try is to anchor inside the stent segment in the LID, anchor inflate balloon, stabilize the position, and uh, really try uh, with to cross uh, with uh, anchoring. And so you have to uh, the guide with your balloon in the LED to give you more push. Yes, so pushability will be increased. Otherwise, uh, you said the imaging was not available. Uh, I think it will be very nice to do imaging, but pull back from the left LED to left main and understand what happens at the ostium of the circ. Uh, because uh, if uh, not even the smallest balloon crosses, imaging will not go into the circ. But with the cut plane of OCT, we can see what happens. So uh, uh, sh show us what, what, you, what you did after this. Well, well, one comment, just a very short comment to this. Uh, uh, you don't show the image, but it would be inter interesting to see where the balloon gets stuck. Because uh, you see sometimes that you see the marker at the level of the carina, but it means if you remember how your stent looks, it means that the real tip of the balloon is maybe even four or five millimeters distal to the distal marker. So there you expect the problem. So. Um, um, uh, yes, I mean, certainly being sure that the, what the, initial, the wires are not behind the back of the stents in the left main is, is what you're getting at, and, and we were certain about that on this case. But if we go on to the next slide, please. And ultimately, by now, inevitably, this is late at night, and, uh, and we stopped. Yeah, Adrian, before proceeding, we see the angio. I, I, I think we need to address a few, few very good uh, comments. Uh, use the reverse wire, dual lumen catheter, uh, to clarify, you did not have problem to cross with the wire. You had problem to cross with balloon or with micro catheter, and you tried both. Balloon, yeah, micro catheter. You you're not in the left behind the stent in the left main. In the left main. Yeah. Okay. Please proceed now and show us what happened after this. Next slide, please. So um, unfortunately, the patient, despite the good angiographic result, was back two weeks later. More chest pain, raised troponin, ST depression in keeping with uh, a problem in the circumflex. And consequently, we had to try and do something else. So if we go on to the next uh, picture, please. And this shows the point you were making, I think, Gabor, where the, where the devices were sticking. So in the left slide, you can see um, uh, we've passed the wire, we've done OCT, we made sure we had uh, OCT available, and we tried again five or six different positions of wires, distally and more proximally, to try and make sure that we could, uh, or try and ensure that we could get catheter passage. In the left-hand picture is a Corsair, which won't go, um, and you can also see uh, another microcatheter on the right-hand side there. Doesn't matter how hard you push, this isn't going to go. So it wasn't really a question of, of purchase. It just would not pass through that particular spot. Next slide, please. And so we decided that the only real option that we had was to try and rotablate. And in the left-hand panel, you can see that I've, I'm trying to rotablate with a 1.5 burr. I've been rotablating for quite a long time. And ultimately, uh, I pushed very hard to the extent that the burr actually comes out, which is really quite dangerous. Um, because it's all fallen out because I'm pushing so hard trying to get through. So ultimately, I stopped. I had to rewire once again. Well, rewiring is easy. Once again, I still can't get anything else down apart from the wire. You know, it was actually quite easy to pass the rotor wire down. But we, passed, we eventually, after 10 minutes of burring, managed to get a 1.25 burr down into the circumflex. <coughs> Fortunately, the patient had a pacemaker, so there was no real issues around anything else. But I was anxious about the amount of heat we were generating burring the stent. Next slide, please. So we were then able to pass a balloon really quite easily and uh, did aggressive balloon inflation up to uh, 28 atmospheres with a 3.5 balloon 
and then undertake a, fine, uh, a kissing balloon inflation, once again, relatively high pressure with 3.5 balloons. Next slide, please. And this was our result. So we then did some imaging again. And if we could move on to show the imaging, please. So we've imaged in both LED and Serpenflex. And what you see here is this big calcified nodule, this ball of calcium, which we saw on the original diagnostic angiogram in retrospect, which is sitting right at the carina of the, uh, of the vessel. And um, although we've influenced it, we um, have not removed it by any means. And as, um, as you can see, what we've had to do is to remove the stent from the carina in order to allow access to our balloons in order to perform expansion. And if you go on to the next slide, you see in the longitudinal view the, uh, the aspect there, where you can see the, uh, the removal of the metal from the calcified uh, surface, um, which has eventually allowed us to access the vessel with our devices. So quite an unusual appearance on OCT um, going forward. And then the next slide, you can see what I, um, the clinical outcome of the case. This is the angiogram on the right-hand side. Um, I'm pleased to say that the patient did very well. But if you look carefully with, your, uh, with the eyes of wisdom, you can still see the ball of calcium, I think, right at the carina um, of the bifurcation there. And I think ultimately, this case illustrates fantastically the benefits of the approach that Gabor uh, highlighted there, that by ensuring that the uh, first stent is well deployed and that the ostium of the side branch or main branch in your collot is absolutely optimized before you move on to the collot may save you trouble in the future. And so I, I speculate to myself that had I done a, a, a kissing predilatation, uh, that perhaps I'd have been highlighted to this issue, or perhaps if I'd imaged more carefully, although I'd already chosen to do rotablation, um, would a bigger burr have made much difference? I'm not sure. When we talked about um, lithotripsy, this is not a concentric calcification. It's a very eccentric calcification. And certainly, uh, I'm not sure. I think my personal experience with uh, lithotripsy and uh, calcified nodules is it doesn't really work unless you've got a complete sleeve of calcium around the vessel. Just a, uh, a quadrant of calcium is not necessarily going to be influenced by the lithotripsy because you don't get the same biomechanical effect of the lithotripsy devices. But I'd be interested to hear what, uh, what Gabor, what uh, Goran, what you think about uh, what else you could have done to, to have saved me this. Uh, yeah, if I can start by sharing comment of uh, our colleague Gufran. He says high pressure non-compliant balloon work very well in calcified nodule. And whether there was a compromise of the osteal LAD after uh, uh, stent ablation towards the circ. There was initially, yeah. Yeah, and then, so yeah. By, by the time I spent an hour and a half getting in, I was going to show that circumflex who the boss was. <laughs> <laughs> uh, another very important, uh, I think, good advice from another colleague of, uh, uh, of us. Uh, he says maybe bigger pot balloon uh, would help opening access towards the circ, but you repeat it three times with the bigger and bigger pot balloon, higher pressure. So I think you reach the maximum, and uh, it's, yeah, it's actually what too, big, too big in the end. I um, I couldn't think of what else to do. I mean, I, yeah, it's a very uncomfortable position. And of course, we've got used to cert, to a certain extent. You know, when you and I trained, Goran, it was it was often difficult to get to recross, and we were almost expected it. But now with the balloons we have, the devices that we have, we expect to be able to kind of get um, behind things and into things. In fact, the, the risk now is that we, yeah. we get behind stuff too easily. Um, yeah. We don't know we're there. Uh, so it, it, Adrian, it, do, you, do you have any experience with laser? Our colleague uh, Sadananda is asking, is laser safe in such clinical scenario? I'm afraid I don't have any experience of laser personally, no. Yeah. Um, but I've but seen I guess, some cases, yes. 
heating would be the issue again, I think. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, to go back one step, there are multiple questions on performing rota in both vessels, LAD and the CERC. And uh, uh, for colleagues less experienced with rota, uh, of course, you do it on a single wire. You don't keep the other wire inside the vessel. But is it safe? What is your experience? Yeah, well, I always do the worst vessel first. Um, so you do the vessel that is the most severely stenosed first. Um, remembering you're pulverizing the material rather than moving material. Um, yes. And I'm, I, I'm about to say I've never lost a vessel when I'm doing it, but I'm, I'm touching wood while I'm doing it. But I'm saying <laughs> that. Um, so I think it is safe. I think if you want to make it safer, you can uh, just be very careful about um, your exchange of wires. Um, and it does come with experience. I don't, I don't think, uh, from, in my practice, I rarely use a 1.25 balloon. I only occasionally, sorry, 1.25 burr. I only very occasionally use a 2.0 burr. Oh, I use a 1.5 or 1.75 burr. Um, and then non-compliant balloons to yeah. post dilate. Uh, multiple questions again regarding the strategy. Uh, for both of you, uh, is the left main angle too wide for culotte? Why not T or tap in that case? Is it really overexpansion of the stand towards the circ in case of the left main and 90 degree angle? What is your thinking on, on that? You know, my uh, if you talk about uh, tap and 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 T, actually it's a it's a matter of a spectrum. So, uh, and again, there is a lot of unpredictability inside. Yeah, uh, you want to go for a for a T and protrusion. If you are a bit more proximal, then you have a lot of protrusion. If you are a bit more distal, then you have gap. Then one says that if you have ninety degree, then you can do very nice T again. If you are a bit too distal, then you have a gap. If you have too proximal, then you have even more protrusion than with with uh, with smaller angles. So there is so much uh, wishful thinking for me in a in a T and protrusion or T techniques that uh, I start somewhere and I have no clue where it ends. Okay, so Adrian, Adrian, from doing osteal right coronary stenting to know that we very rarely are completely perpendicular to the ostium. And if you then start thinking about doing the same thing, either in a left main bifurcation or a LED D1, it's so difficult to be sure that it's a true T. Yeah, thank you very much both for sharing excellent cases. Uh, as at every webinar, I really learn a lot from both of you and I thank you for sharing also complication, Adrian. I think it's very nice. I've seen in my life only one stent tablation the noise was really terrifying and I was really waiting to see if the bird will pass through the struts or not. So if I can have my final slides, uh, just to conclude that in general, I think nowadays we, we all agree that in long diffuse disease of the side branch, something like definition two study criteria by Professor Shaoliang Chen with the lesion which is more than 10 millimeters, stenosis more than 90% uh, or 70% at the ostium of the circ, or in case of high risk of losing the side branch or difficult access, we need to think in advance of two stand strategy. Strategy depends on the estimated risk of losing the side branch, so we can do it either as a provisional or inverted provisional, adding the layers of complexity and finalizing with T, tap or culotte, depends on the anatomy, angulation, vessel size discrepancy and personal preference. Or we can do decay crush in case especially of the left main because we have data from clinical trials. When we plan to stand strategy, we recommend to use it in a provisional stepwise fashion and we learn from Gabor and his bench testing the benefit of doing double kissing, similar to double kissing in crash, double kissing also helps optimizing the result of culotte technique. And for operators with appropriate experience, of course, 
DK crash is valuable option for complex left main while we are awaiting results of EBC main study. And we believe uh, if we uh, succeed, uh, we would like to present it next year at PCR 2021, of course, in case that it's accepted. And I really keep my fingers crossed to have the data available by that time. So I thank you both for excellent presentations. I thank all our attendees for help and support and also for multiple important questions. We learn a lot from you. Please keep supporting us and uh, sending your questions and excellent comments. And of course, I would like to thank Metronic for supporting this continuum of bifurcation PCI. I think it's very important to be always updated and to have possibility to discuss and exchange our experience, practice, and our techniques. So I thank you very much, and I'm looking forward to seeing you in January for the next webinar on DK Crash. So unique chance to discuss with European experts, Professor Maci Lesiak, uh, from uh, Dr. Vaquerizo from uh, Spain, but we will have also the inventor of DK Crash, Professor Shaoliang Chen, as our guest. So follow us and send your questions in advance. We will have unique opportunity to focus 60 minutes on updating DK Crash. I thank you very much again, and I wish you a nice day. Stay safe and uh, safe with uh, this. Thank you very much. Have a nice day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.